Welcome, everybody. Great to have you with us tonight. David's going to start our introductions tonight. Go ahead, David. Thank you, Janice. On behalf of Community Advocates and Jews United for Democracy and Justice, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the 11th month of our weekly town halls, America at a Crossroads. The Executive Committee of Judge Janice Cameron Oresnik, former Congressman Nell Levine, former Supervisor Zevi Arsovsky, Rabbi Ken Chase, and Caroline Kenny and Kelly and I are proud to be presenting these programs. We have an expanding list of co-sponsors from across the country, from Southern California to New York to Massachusetts. You saw them listed on our opening screen and we'll every week see them every week going forward. We are grateful to them for all their help in publicizing these programs. Next week, we will be joined by one of the most familiar faces on television, Wolf Blitzer. If you have not seen him in his role as nightly anchor of the Situation Room on C CNN, you're likely to have seen his doppelganger on Saturday Night Live. He'll be discussing the media's role in combating misinformation with KCRW's Madeline Brand, one of our most popular hosts. In two weeks, we will have the incomparable David Brooks, a New York Times columnist and a fixture on the PBS NewsHour since 2004. He'll discuss the road to revival, America in 2021 with the LA Times Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Pat Morrison. In coming weeks, we'll hold Farid Zakaria, the Rand Corporation's maven on truth decay, Jennifer Kavanaugh, who'll be teamed with the Washington Post, Jennifer Rubin, and much more. Please look at the slide at the end of the program for more of our upcoming town halls. It's now my pleasure to turn the program back to the founder of Jews United for Democracy and Justice, an old and dear friend, and an irresistible force for meaningful, positive change, change Janice Cameron Oresnik. Janice? Wow, thank you, David. It's my honor tonight to be able to uh, introduce you to our speakers. Uh, we are very proud tonight to have Brian Michael Jenkins with us. Uh, Mr. Jenkins is an American expert on terrorism and transportation security. During his nearly four decades of analysis, Mr. Jenkins has advised governments, private corporations, the Catholic Church, the Church of England, and many others on terrorist threats. He serves as senior advisor to the president of the Rand Corporation and director of the Mineta Transportation Institute's Transportation Security Center. He has served as a member of the White House Commission on Aviation Safety and Security and as an advisor to the National Commission on Terrorism. He has advised the U.S. State Department, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, the Nucle Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and many others. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with his many books and with his many appearances as, as an analyst on various news stations. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, for being with us. And we all appreciate your earphones. We're working hard to bring you the best possible sound that we can. We'd also like to welcome tonight Javed Ali. Thank you, Mr. Ali, for being with us. Mr. Ali is a former senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council with over 20 years of professional experience in national security and intelligence issues in Washington, DC. He served in the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, where he also held senior positions on joint duty assignments at the National Intelligence Council and the National Counterterrorism Center, as well as at the National Security Council. Currently, Javed is the Townsley Foundation Policymaker in Residence at the Ford School for, po for Policy at the University of Michigan, where he is currently teaching counterterrorism, past, present, and future, and cybersecurity for future leaders. Both of our guests tonight have extraordinary careers and a huge wealth of information to be able to share with us in the, in the domain of domestic security. And we really appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom and experience with us. And to guide our discussion is our very good friend, a fixture in the LA radio world, Larry Mantle. He has been the host of Air Talk with Larry Mantle, a call-in radio talk show on NPR member station KPCC, that's 89.3 FM, since April 1st, 1985. That's an amazing longevity in that industry. That makes Air Talk the longest running daily talk show in Southern California. And he is one of the most beloved people in our city. Larry, the Zoom is all yours. Thank you all. Janice, thank you so much. Very kind words and I appreciate it very much. I feel like the luckiest 
person in Los Angeles because of all the wonderful people that I get to talk with, the important issues that we deal with on the program. And so to be able to do this on a regular basis with judge and with community advocates uh, is very, very special. So Janice, thank you. David, I appreciate it so much. Mel and Zev and all the folks with judge and community advocates and the sponsors of these uh, America at the Crossroads conversations. Uh, as I, I said, you know, I, on the radio, I get a chance to talk about these very important issues on a daily basis. But one of the things I love about America at the crossroads is the chance to have these terrific guests for a full, uninterrupted hour of conversation, including the great questions that we get from participants like yourself. So please don't be shy about asking a question. Uh, and if you would, please put down the city where you're watching this. I know we have international viewers as well as across the United States and from uh, right in Southern California from where we originate these programs. So gives a nice sense of place if you would do that along with your question for our guests. The January 6th attack on the US Capitol took place as I was live on the air. Uh, joining me was Anita Kumar, who was White House correspondent and associate editor of Politico. And she was joining me to talk about uh, the counting of the electoral votes taking place in Congress that day. And as events started spinning out of control, uh, and I was watching cable news in the studio following the Associated Press wire, uh, Anita following her all her Twitter feed and the reporters who were there on scene, this, um, this terrifying story started unfolding as I was live on the air. And I did my best to try when we didn't quite know what was going on to give some sense to the listeners um, how serious this was. But in fact, at that time, we didn't have a sense of how far into the US Capitol um, the mob went. We didn't know the tremendous physical threat to members of Congress. We didn't know that people would be killed as a result. And so for us to find all this out later and to see the uh, terrible video that we saw during the impeachment trial of President Trump, uh, which gave further details on this, raises concerns for all of us about uh, domestic terrorism, what is the degree of threat, what is the likelihood of other incidents following on the heels of this terrible event on January 6th. We're gonna get a chance to learn much more about that. And uh, let me begin, Javed, with you to ask you, you um, you've referenced UCLA political scientist David Rappaport's The Four Waves of Rebel Terrorism, and you've used that as sort of the platform to describe this as the fifth wave. You know, what are those and what is the wave that you see us in now? Yeah, uh, thanks, Larry, for that question. And, and thanks uh, as well for, um, for David and Janice and everyone at Judge uh, for having me here. It's always an honor to share the stage with Brian someone who I've known and respected for several uh, years. But um, to answer your question directly, um, so the 2002 article, um, I think is one of the most brilliant terrorism articles uh, out there. It's uh, folks who aren't as familiar with it now um, should, should um, uh, you can go find it on the internet, but it talks about the four waves of rebel terrorism uh, that had occurred um, from the 1880s till the time the article was written in 2002. And so the, um, Professor Rappaport described these four waves as uh, an anarchist wave that started in the 1880s and lasted until about the 1920s. Uh, the second wave after that was an anti-colonialist wave that lasted from the 1920s through the 1960s. The third wave that he described was something called the New Left, and that form of terrorism, uh, in his opinion, started in the 1960s and then went into uh, the mid to late 1980s. And then the fourth wave that he described was the religious wave of terrorism. And he, so he used the jumping off point of that being um, the Iranian revolution, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the development of the jihadist groups that we started to see um, like Al Qaeda in those uh, early years uh, in the 1980s. And then he argued that wave um, was still on a, some type of upward crest. And then this was in the aftermath of 9-11 and then his analysis stopped and that article hasn't been refreshed. So I used um, that framework to then write this opinion piece uh, a couple of weeks ago that took um, that and then also stretched out time a little bit to, 
to say this, this terrorism phenomenon we're seeing here in the United States, certainly on the far right end of the, the spectrum, I would argue, and it's not, um, it's not a consensus view, I'm sure there's people who push back on me, but I would argue this wave started in the late 2000s uh, with several factors propelling it. The election of President Obama, the economic uh, downturn, the rise in far right uh, populist and, and nationalist political parties, not only in the United States, um, but overseas. And these factors then started to, to brew. Uh, and then over the last decade plus, you've seen an increase in the velocity, the scope, and the lethality of this wave inside the United States. So here we are in 2021. And if you take Professor Rappaport's wave theory of waves lasting between 20 or 40 years, if my thesis is correct, that this, this wave that we're in right now, which I call the new right wave, um, we're perhaps either only on the upward part of the slope or perhaps somewhere in the middle. Uh, is that but, because you, you see it as you were saying earlier, a, a 20 year cycle, is, is that why? At a minimum 20 year cycle. And again, Professor Rappaport, some of his cycles lasted up to 40 years. So. If that's the right framework to look at this phenomena now, we are nowhere out of the woods yet. We may only be in the early phases of this. How does January 6th fit into this fifth wave? Uh, it's certainly, it's, I wouldn't say it's a combination. I would say it's a manifestation of, of all the factors that have been propelling and fueling this wave. So even the factors that I think, uh, or that I mentioned that started this wave about a decade plus ago, there have been other factors that have moved it along and given it even more oxygen over the last couple of years. And very quickly, uh, because I definitely want to hear what Brian has to say on this, um, I would say some of those factors are issues like the impact of COVID, um, the deepening political and social and cultural fissures in this country that have only seemed to have been accentuated and gotten worse over the past couple of years. And then the role of social media is either the echo chamber or the uh, the platform or the, the glue that binds people together. So they don't have to meet any more in the physical domain. They can meet all virtually and share these extreme beliefs and ideas um, and do it at a, a far greater scope than, than you could do in person. So um, I, I think there are several factors that are, that are moving this wave forward and it's going to take a completely new paradigm to roll this wave back. And that's, I think that's the goal of the Biden administration. Brian, it's so good to see you. And uh, it's been a while since you've been in studio for the radio program. I'm looking forward to us getting back to, to those days. But um, the term terrorism, uh, not universally described to the attack and the insurrection at the Capitol January 6th, um, do you think that it qualifies as an act of terrorism? And, and does that designation in and of itself matter? In, in, in terms of qualifying as an act of terrorism, I mean, certainly, uh, I think the consensus view among those who, who look at this issue, it would be, yes, it does. A number of my, a number of my colleagues have, have said that it does. Uh, I, strictly looking at it within the... Uh, you know, U.S. Uh, uh, law, it, it probably qualifies as an insurrection. Having said that, I don't know that our, that, that vocabulary is entirely useful. In fact, I've been arguing that um, to, to frame this exclusively in terms of terrorism uh, is perhaps not the best way we can uh, make progress in going forward. I know that I was uh, probably uh, swimming upstream when I testified before Congress a couple of weeks ago, there is, there is great momentum in Congress for a new uh, anti-terrorism anti -terrorism legislation, uh, a, a domestic uh, terrorism law to correspond with the, um, with the international uh, uh, terrorism law that we have on the books. I, I remain, frankly, very wary of that uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, one, the, the, the term terrorism is, is, it carries a lot of baggage. It, it's a pejorative. It is, it, apart from its precise definition, it is, if you can attach the label terrorism to your opponents, 
then by doing so that gives one a certain moral and political advantage. So we end up in great discussions about who the terrorists are. Nothing new about these debates. I mean, these debates took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s when, when terrorism in its contemporary form uh, emerged as an issue again with hijackings of airliners, kidnappings of diplomats, uh, uh, terrorist groups going abroad to carry out their attacks. There, there, there was an effort to define terrorism. So are, are you concerned that this becomes a kind of slippery slope, that we start calling extremists terrorists, and, and then pretty soon in tit for tat kind of labeling of different groups up with a meaningless term? Is, and, and not only that, the potential of an anti-terrorism law being used to, to chill dissent. Well, I, I think clearly those are, are dangers. There's dangers to, to civil liberties. And especially when we, when we try to hastily pass legislation in the wake of some outrage. And, and of course, uh, uh, fist pound podiums, uh, Congress must be seen to be doing something. And that often leads to drive-by legislation, which has often unintended consequences. So that's, that's one danger. The second thing is when, when people talk about a domestic terrorism law, what they really are referring to, uh, albeit not necessarily knowing that they're referring to that, is the, um, a domestic version of the material support provision uh, for international terrorism. And that is where it is a crime to provide support um, provide material support, and that can be that can be assisting in propaganda, can be volunteering to join the organization. Uh, the courts since 9/11 have defined that very, very broadly. Um, to to have a a domestic version of that, but one of the prerequisites of that law is it has to be to provide material assistance to a designated terrorist organization, and that's where the trouble begins because we're going to end up with arguments in government about who the terrorists are. And as divided as we are now politically, everyone is going to have their own favored list of terrorists. Uh, President Trump uh, spoke last year about Antifa being a terrorist organization. Others have the, the Proud Boys in, in their sights. Um, there are hundreds of domestic groups that are already identified as potentially extremist groups to try to then sort that out, which one of those will merit the label terrorism in a kind of political debate, it really becomes a complete, a, a, a complete distraction. Moreover, is... when we talk, I was gonna say one more thing. When we talk about organizations, Organization is a very slippery word when we talk about domestic organizations. Some of these are organizations. Some of these are movements. Some of these are nothing more than mindsets. Well, and I wonder if part of the issue, too, is at what point do you call the organization, if you can even define an organization as terroristic, based on uh, material support that might come from individual members? How many members is it that have to be involved in that material support? I could see where, where organizations that the overwhelming majority of us would not think of as by any means terroristic might have some, some people that are just off in that organization who say outrageous things on social media, but you wouldn't think of putting the whole organization under that terminology. Well, this is this is the difficulty, and and there's a further difficulty in in it in in the sense that, um, again, uh, starting with strategy, looking at the deep divisions in American society, I think it is probably best to keep these activities that we see when we talk about domestic violence, uh, violent extremists, violence in various forms is a crime itself. We have ample laws. Uh, in the code, in the criminal code, to prosecute. We have prosecuted, we've gone through um, the, the, the so-called uh, David Rappaport's third wave when we were dealing with the various terrorist groups of the 1970s, the New World Liberation Front, uh, the, the, the Weather Underground and so on. We dealt with those without a domestic criminal statute. 
We well, in dealt fact, with... we see at the, at the Capitol, those that have been arrested, there are all kinds of charges that are being filed against those individuals. There, there are no crimes that go unpunished for want of a statute. And, and, and so what a lot of the argument is about uh, introducing domestic uh, uh, terrorism legislation has to do with, in a sense, somehow elevating it to a higher moral plane or calling public attention to the issue. In my view, though, that's a counterproductive approach and those are not appropriate reasons for adding new criminal statutes. Javid, what do you think of that? Boy, at risk of contradicting anything that Brian says, let me take a different uh, position or at least explore uh, the contours of a different position. So um, I agree, I mean, whether uh, there is a new statute that adds actual crimes to the existing definition of domestic terrorism, which exists under federal statute 18 USC 2331. You can find the, the definition of domestic terrorism, but the problem for prosecutors and my former colleagues in the FBI is that there are no criminal penalties associated with that definition. So it's great to have that the activity defined, but you can't bring a charge for domestic terrorism related activity because there are no penalties that that um, attach to that. And then perhaps relatedly or even separately, the issue of the domestic or a domestic terrorism organization list and how that would mirror, as Brian said, uh, the existing foreign terrorist organization list and then the connection to material support charges. So there is intense debate on either side of, of those legal avenues, whether sure. adding cr crimes to the to the penal to the existing definition or coming up with a list. But I would argue for at least let's have the conversation about the pros and cons. I, I think that's a healthy thing to do. And maybe the, the decision is to not go forward, but at least let's have some smart people look at this in a way that perhaps we haven't before. Javed, aren't, aren't there aren't char uh, charges that you could file against uh, people who conspire to overthrow the government or to commit acts of violence against public figures, uh, to attack government buildings? Aren't there, even before a physical crime is committed, aren't, aren't there statutes under which people could be prosecuted? Sure, and there's conspiracy charges that have been levied against um, folks from January 6th, but another really instructive uh, example of, of this labeling and sort of describing activity um, here in the United States is, and this is very close to where I am now here in Michigan, the plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer um, from last fall. 14 people arrested in that. They took a number of steps in furtherance of that conspiracy and that plot. Um, thankfully, it was disrupted because of early sort of insight um, from the FBI and, and law enforcement. But from a prosecution standpoint, uh, of the 14 people arrested, six charged under federal law, the word terrorism does not show up in those charges because, again, there's no terrorism-related penalty that applies. But conspiracy, kidnapping, you know, they're facing what, serious charges there. What would be the advantage of charging them under a, a terrorism statute. Yeah, and this is where I think, again, we need to think this one through, is that if, if there is that option for prosecutors to bring forward, then you could describe the activity for what it actually is. So instead of calling it a kidnapping plot, call it an act of domestic terrorism because it fits the definition of domestic terrorism. And at least the, the I, Governor Whitmer plot. Yeah, Brian, your response to that. Yeah, let me, let me follow through with that. Um, Clearly, there is a debate about this, and, and, and there ought to be that, that discussion about it. But, and there is, by the way, a way of applying uh, the domestic terrorism statute that exists now, which is not a standalone crime, but is rather an enhancement uh, to an existing crime. So that is, if one commits a, a, a crime, an ordinary crime, that is one set of sentencing guidelines. If that crime is committed, uh, under the under the broad category of, of a terrorism related crime, then that moves uh, that crime into a higher sentencing category. So in other words, it increases the potential punishment of it. So we, so we do have that. Interestingly enough, in prosecutions, it is not used 
that often. And there's a, a reinfor reason for that. And that is prosecutors are practical people. Um, if they've got a charge, attempted murder, attempted kidnapping, conspiracy to carry out a, a, a bombing or something like that, those are, those are pretty good charges to go with. To add the enhancement to that gets the prosecution into, in the courtroom, into discussions of motivation, intentions, and so on. And so in many cases, just as a practical matter, the, the, the prosecutors don't necessarily want to go in that direction. Let me give you a concrete example. It's not about applying or not applying a, a, a terrorist enhancement, but let's look at one of the most uh, a, a dramatic incident of right-wing terrorism in this country in modern history. And um, the second uh, uh, bloodiest terrorist attack on American soil, and that was Timothy McVeigh's bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Now, Timothy McVeigh was uh, uh, charged with killing eight federal police officers. He was convicted of that charge and he was executed. The reason for that specific charge is that charge carried uh, in, in federal crime. It's one of the few federal crimes that was a capital crime. That is, it carried the death penalty and that's what, uh, that's what they sought. Um, there was, had that charge failed, a backup charge in the state of Oklahoma, uh, Timothy McVeigh was charged with 168 counts of murder. Now, when we're talking about killing eight federal police officers or killing 168 citizens, we really don't need a terrorism enhancement. And, and it, it, is, it is a heinous crime. And as I say, he was found guilty and he was executed. Um, and by the way, interestingly enough, the prosecutor, that, the, the man that orchestrated that prosecutor was just confirmed today as the new attorney general of the United States, Merrick, Merrick Garland. Garland. Uh, I, I, I want to sort of pull back a little bit to talk about all of this is about how do we deter domestic terrorism by whatever term we use for it, extremist violence and, and threats to, to our elected officials and to our government generally. So Javed, what, what do you think are the ways? Do you think that, for example, the prosecutions um, in the case of the January 6th attack will have a chilling effect on others who might you know, consider that sort of attack? Um, or are there other ways you would advocate for being able to successfully deter these attacks? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Larry. And I think we have to take the same approach of using uh, a whole range of, of tools um, at the disposal of the US government, also working with state and local government uh, as well. But um, in the post 9-11 world, and that's where I spent a lot of my career in counterterrorism, um, one thing the US working with foreign partners overseas is use the hard power toolkit um, to, with devastating effects against a range of terrorist groups. Doesn't mean we've militarily defeated anyone, but still we applied a tremendous amount of pressure against groups overseas. Uh, none of those tools can be used domestically, right? So um, that's something we have to think through. What are, the, what are the hard power end of the toolkit that you could use domestically? Is it the new uh, authorities, new laws, new uh, tools for prosecutors to go after folks, whether you know terrorism is part of that um, regime or not. But there has to be a, a hard power element here. But there, just like in the international terrorism side, there has to be an equal amount on the soft power or the non-kinetic side. And that's something in the international terrorism world, the U.S. didn't do very well because we were really good at the hard power stuff and not as much effort on the soft power. I think. Um, because of all the, the, the issues that you're dealing with in the United States, dealing with Americans, protected activity, the Constitution, the hard power toolkit is going to be more constrained. So we have to get more creative about the soft power side. And so whether that's um, more training for uh, sort of educators or more funding for state and local law enforcement, whether it's a better partnership between the federal government and state and local uh, 
um, government on information sharing about the threat, what the threat looks like. These are all things that have to be reconceptualized what, here. What about social media? Because this, of course, is an organizing space that uh, was not available in the previous waves. And um, but of course, there you also get into many of the speech issues. And, you know, at this point, you have uh, former President Trump, whose platforms are are blocked at this point, as as well as others. Um, I assume I'm assuming that's temporary, that the technology exists, that people are going to find a way to communicate. And um, so is there any way that you see that, uh, and I guess I'll, I'll start with you on this, Brian, then go to Javid, but social media, um, there can be interventions that would be effective there. I, I think that is, um, I think that's a, it's a key question and we're still struggling with this uh, because we are one of the few countries in the world that has written in our constitution as the first amendment the protection of free speech. And, and, and that protection is, is very, very strong. Uh, and as we get into how government might, might get into this area, I mean, look, it, it is appropriate for government to deal with law brokers, law, lawbreakers. Uh, it is, it is uh, a, a appropriate for government to try to, in a sense, maintain domestic tranquility. That's, that's a function of government. Uh, but how far can the government go in, in patrolling, patrolling speech, patrolling thought, uh, and, and so on? That, that, that is a fraught area. I, uh, I think as a first step that we might, that we probably can do is that we know that, for example, the, the algorithms of, of the social media platforms uh, don't simply provide a forum for free speech. Uh, now, some of the technical companies like to take the position that they are merely a public park space and, and they cannot be held responsible for the speeches made on the soapboxes in, in the park any more than the grass in the park can be uh, held but, responsible but for that. But they do amplify them. But that is, they amplify it, they do more than they amplify it. They propel it through their algorithms so that whatever uh, uh, one's uh, interactions on social media are, uh, the result of these algorithms is to be put in touch with, to facilitate contact with, in a sense, with other like-minded individuals. Now, that may be something as benign as you know, uh, one collects toy trains, or it can be in a malevolent sense that one uh, has, has uh, concerns about some of these particular issues. That those are private companies making decisions about uh, what takes place on platforms they control. Newspapers deal with, have dealt with these, these questions historically. A newspaper, a television station, a radio station bears some responsibility for what it allows through. As I say, the, 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 the platform, social media platform companies say, no, we, we, we don't take that responsibility. They may have to. Yeah, and, and, and Javid, what, what do you think? Because, I mean, the flip side of this is, and, and um, let me know if you if you think this is a you know bogus idea, but my sense has always been if you if you push speech underground, it just finds another way, and then with it being less transparent, there's an even greater chance of a surprise coming your way. Yeah, there there is there is risk in in any direction in which you you look at this, but on the social media side, I agree with Brian. Um, that they, there does need to be uh, an enhanced level of responsibility. And I'm not suggesting that it's you know across the board, uh, it's not responsible, but um, there needs to be more sort of recognition that because these are private sector companies who have very clearly told the US government, and I you know, sort of understood that when I was in government um, at the time that they do not want the, the United States government or Congress telling them what to do or how to, how to run their businesses. 
fine. But at the same time, and we were struggling with this during the, the ISIS threat in the mid 2000s, when all the mainstream social media platforms have been hijacked by ISIS um, and the social media companies were very slow to recognize what was happening uh, within their systems that um, it you know took some tough conversations for them to realize that this is probably bad for your business and bad for your brand. And rather than having the government tell you what to do, you probably need to sort of handle this yourself. So there was a slow evolution in the mid 2000s to the late 2000s where the social media companies did scale up on that foreign extremist threat. Um, but I think this, this one that we're facing now inside the US is very different. There are a whole host of other legal issues that Brian's already referenced, but there has to be more leadership um, on the social media side and they have to develop more capability because the alternative is if they don't, there are members of Congress who will, like to, who will want to swing some kind of hammer on them. And I think they're going to try to avoid that as much as possible. And on the, the, the issue that you talked about too, Larry, that if if the social media companies do scale up and do take more of this content um, offline or, or, or close accounts, yes, um, it pushes people to other corners of the internet where it's harder to, to see and observe what they're doing. Or if your tradecraft is really good, you're not going to be openly talking about anything on social media. You're going to just be quietly communicating with your like-minded colleagues the way professional terrorists do, and they don't use telephones, and it's all face-to-face, -face, and that those are the kind of plots that are always the most difficult to uh, to find, and, and that is a risk of, of pushing this off mainstream social media sites. I want to quickly get to audience questions, but I, I before we do that, I want to ask you both just uh, briefly, why is domestic terrorism more challenging than foreign terrorism. Uh, I think that might surprise people. Brian? Well, you know, if we, if we look at our experience with, with uh, dealing with homegrown jihadist terrorists in this country, um, uh, clearly that, although there were undoubtedly excesses, uh, especially at the beginning in terms of violations of civil rights, uh, nonetheless, over the long term, uh, the the institutions, the FBI. I mean, uh, the work and and and, and Javed deserve, deserves a, a credit for being part of that. It did deal with that very very effectively. What makes the domestic thing so different from that is that number one, we are talking about we are talking about views. We are talking about belief systems that are deeply embedded in American society that go back uh, well over a hundred years. I mean, when we talk about uh, white supremacism, anti-Semitism, uh, a, a kind of a violent nativism, uh, uh, anti-feminism. By the way, the right is a, is a whole uh, skein of antis uh, as opposed to an, an, a positive ideology. It's what, what it, is it against? Um, those have long histories, deeply embedded, and there is constituency. The, the jihadist ideologies never really gained traction in the American Muslim community. When we talk about domestic terrorism and some of these views, it is a completely different story. And, and simply, we are not able to strip mine every vein of bigotry from American society. Uh, that is a problem. The, the domestic terrorists are better armed. Uh, the domestic terrorists um, in many cases have, in, in, in a number of cases, have military or police training. Um, the, the domestic terrorists, that, that constituency that they have is also going to make it a lot harder. There's going to be a lot more resistance than going after uh, uh, the, the, the violent extremists in a way that we went after the jihadist uh, extremists in this country. Moreover, one thing, the jihadist, the, the effort to deal with jihadist terrorists began with, it, it preceded that, but really was galvanized by 9-11. Um, January 6th is not the equivalent of a 9-11. A 9-11 brought about, at least briefly, a sense of national unity, a sense of national purpose. 
this was a serious threat to the Republic. Um, in the case of January 6th, we've seen already that whatever brief moment of reflection there may have been in the political discourse after that has now gone back into the bellicose divided rhetoric that we see coming out of Washington now. I have a quick question uh, before I go to job, but, uh, but just real quick, quickly, you mentioned how well armed so many extremists on the right are. Um, thankfully, they didn't bring firearms to the Capitol, but I was curious why that was. Now, I know it's very difficult to smuggle a, a, a arm onto a, an aircraft, but uh, bear spray was there. There were other things that would have been illegal to fly with. And so clearly there was some degree of provision made in DC. Why do you think, fortunately, that they weren't armed with, uh, with guns? The, the honest answer is, I don't know, but keep an, and, and as we come to these trials of these individuals who have been charged, we're going to learn a, a, a great deal more. As to, as to some of the thinking that went behind it. But keep in mind that of those, at least thus far, who have been arrested for January 6th, about 10% of them belong to identifiable groups with violent histories, Proud Boys, Oath Takers, things of this sort. The other 90% were ordinary folks. I mean, shopkeepers, housewives, teachers, others, who, were, who went along with this because they believed uh, that they were following the president's instructions to stop an election from being illegitimately stolen from the president himself. Now, they may be damn fools. It's not gonna be much of a defense at their trials that they believe that, but the fact is that a lot of these people were ordinary folks, which brings me back to the issue of let's be careful about who we start calling terrorists. We don't want to get in a situation where we end up calling, making half of the half of the American public enemies of the state. Yeah, Javed, so same question for you about why are domestic terrorism harder to deal with? Yeah, I'm just kind of uh, reinforcing a lot of the points that Brian made, but um, you're dealing with Americans who um, can operate under the cloak of protected activity. You're dealing with a completely different legal framework than on the international terrorism side. As I mentioned before, the toolkit that we have for counterterrorism overseas, almost none of it applies inside the United States. So the Again, this is a completely different kind of um, scenario that's confronting the Biden administration. But I, I do agree very much with um, Brian on the notion of the pool of people seems to be much deeper and much wider and much more ideologically diverse um, in this very fragmented and diffuse um, sort of far right spectrum that we're looking at than whatever that number was at the heyday of either the, you know, the highest point of influence of Al-Qaeda or the ISIS message inside the US. I think that this number that we're dealing with now or this pool seems to me, I can't prove it, uh, it's more intuitive, um, exponentially bigger than that jihadist pool, whether it's in you know, orders of 20 or 30 or 100, I'm not sure, but it seems significantly larger, which is going to, again, cause uh, problems for, for law enforcement. Let me ask some questions. We have some terrific ones from our audience. Uh, and let's do this as quickly as, as we can. I know it's hard with a subject like this is complex, but as rapid fire as we can. Patrick in New Jersey asks, what is the end game for violent extremists or what do they see as their end game? Brian, real briefly. Um, interestingly enough, they, they coalesce around one issue and that is, as I said, they're anti there, the, co the issue that brings them together is, is hostility toward the federal government. They're not looking for uh, joining the political process. They are looking to destroy the political process. Do they envision, though, some sort of a, of a right-wing government that would take its place with, a, you know, a strongman leader? Or what, 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 what does that look like? 
It, 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 again, it's, it's interesting if you read some of the literature it, that there, there's not really a sort of a, a sequential strategy that brings us to that point. It, 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 it's more like a Wagnerian opera with, with uh, thunderbolts and, 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 and lightning and a leader descends from the clouds and, and creates this new uh, in, in environment. No, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a laid out plan of how, how they get there. So it's more about the fight, it sounds like, Javid. Yeah, just kind of building off what Brian said. I mean, I, I think it depends, right? It depends what, type, what part of the threat you're looking at. For some, um, I would agree there is that Wagnerian type, you know, um, sort of scenario, but others um, very much believe in the activity that they're involved in or that they wish to be involved in will lead to the collapse of the federal government. So there's a there's a thought out there called the accelerationist movement and uh, the movement like the Boogaloo, people who align themselves with the Boogaloo movement think that sort of this hyper violence against law enforcement would create this civil war inside the United States and bring down the current political order. I mean, it sounds like a fantasy, but there looks like hundreds if not thousands of people who believe that. You, know, you, you take that um, belief system and then contrast it with the QAnon, one that's also hard to describe um, with a neat label, but you know what is the end state for QAnon uh, believers with militia groups? Likewise, you know very different from some of the other ones. What is their end state? So I think it all depends on which type of or which aspect of the threat you're looking at. It's not monolithic. Uh, Michael asks uh, Brian. I've seen you describe terrorism as theater. Uh, speaking of Wagnerian, uh, does the capital attack qualify as, as a theatrical event in, in that way? I, I, I certainly think it does. It, it will be a, it, it's a pivotal point. And, and I, I wrote an article about this called The Battle of Capitol Hill. Uh, it, it creates a mythology of, uh, um, that will be very, very important going forward. It, it's, a, it's a cultural iconic moment. It, it, in a sense, it's, it's the, the Woodstock, or, although a more malevolent version for far-right extremists. Uh, there, we've had a couple of questions and I'm gonna put them together about members of Congress that uh, members of our audience see as, as helping to egg on to encourage um, the pushback against the election, encouraging the notion that it was an illegitimate election, and by extension, fueling the violence against the Capitol. Um, Javed, your, your thoughts on, on any culpability of those elected officials? Well, this is going to be another really interesting dynamic and in how it plays out from a legal perspective. Will any of these members of Congress or members of the former Trump uh, White House, will they be held uh, account for some of that rhetoric or some of that speech? The bar is probably going to be very high from a legal perspective and um, whether it even has uh, some kind of um, violent extremist uh, angle to it from a prosecution standpoint, not sure. But um, just like Brian described, how uh, prosecutors have to make tough choices about the paths they choose um, on whatever legal strategy or legal avenue uh, they want to engage in. I, I think it's also going to be very um, interesting to see how that plays out um, because you know building the case to prove that in a court of law, a federal court of law, will probably be very difficult. So that might be one reason why we don't see more uh, prosecutorial attention on that versus other crimes. They know they can they can charge people with. Diana asks, uh, clearly these extremists believe the misinformation they're espousing. And how do we counteract those widespread lies? Brian? Ha, huh. um, I, I, I don't have a good answer to this. And this is just what we, we've seen that it, because there is free speech in our, in, in our society and is protected. Um, we, 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 see, we see these things spread through not only social media, but certain media outlets and, and so on. And a lie that is repeated and repeated again and again uh, becomes increasingly believable. It, it, you know, it, it's a matter in, in a sense, warfare and, and politics is, is less a matter of truth, which, is, uh, which really has decayed in our society and, and our, our political discourse.
and it's more a matter of manipulation of perceptions. I don't yeah. have a good answer. To yeah, that. Javed, do you have you have any ideas? Because I mean, it, se it seems like it's the challenge is you've got disaffected people who believe society is going to hell in a handbasket, and and a story emerges to kind of backfill and fill that space. And the story can be absolutely outlandish, like QAnon or other examples, but but it all supports a notion of this thing that people are so deeply unhappy with and gives some, in their mind, some sort of um, sort of story that gets them ultimately to where they want to go. How do you undermine that? Yeah, I mean, again, this is going to be another tough challenge, but um, I think there are sort of supply side strategies that could be used and demand side as well. Um, on the supply side, tackling the, the role of social media in this uh, in this space, I think is going to be um, significant. And we've talked about some of the things that social media companies hopefully will, will do in the future. And then on the uh, demand side, I mean, again, this is where education and training can come in at a very grassroots or, or local level. You know, how does the US educational system build in some resilience for future generations going forward on this topic? It'll be fascinating to see if that plays out as well in some of the policy choices that are made. We have a question from Stephen in Boca Raton. Uh, great to have you with us from Florida, Stephen. How likely are we to see additional homegrown violence here in the US, Brian? I, I, I think it is I think it is likely. I, I think what's happening now uh, in, in the, the, among the far right extremists are several things. Uh, number one, uh, displayed in January 6th, was a coalescence of, of, of many different banners and flags that we saw outside the, the Capitol. They're coming together like any conference. There were ample opportunities for networking. These groups are, are, are communicating with each other. Uh, there's a shared experience that contributes to the, 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 um, uh, the narrative now. But be, beyond that, what we are seeing, I think, is that it certainly the action caused revulsion among many people. We are seeing some people peel away from it. Uh, on the other hand, that's not going to deter the uh, the diehards. Uh, so what will happen is they will go. There'll be fewer in number, but they will go into clandestinity to continue the struggle using violent means. And so I think we're in for a very turbulent decade ahead. Oh, all right, Javed. Yeah, I would agree with Brian on that. And if you look at um, sort of patterns and trends and data from even 2015 going forward, even, even though none of those events have been labeled domestic terrorism for all the reasons we've talked about before, but I guess starting with the Dylan Roof attack in Charleston in, in 2015 and going forward, we've averaged in this country uh, one about one lethal attack a year that can be... Um, up to you know, killing several dozen people like the attack in El Paso in 2019 to, to, to lower numbers. But it seems that we're averaging about one lethal attack, but several disrupted plots. That's the bigger indicator uh, beyond the, the successful attack uh, or attacks is that there every year since 2015, there have been between eight to 10 to 12 disrupted plots by the FBI working with state and local law enforcement in this, again, this broad spectrum of far right extremist activity. I think that is what the threat is going to look like for some period of time, as Brian suggested. I, January 6th may be the outlier, um, an event of that kind of scale and scope. Um, but I think we are going to see this persistent, enduring level of plotting that's going to occur. And the, the threat, the, or the, the potential targets are so vast. That's the thing. We're going to have to also come up with a new paradigm for how we secure the country against this particular threat. We Brian, can't harden uh, every building. Brian, I, I want to, uh, I'm sure you did it much more effectively in your testimony before the House Homeland Security Committee uh, back on February 4th, when you were called to Washington to testify about the, the attack on the US Capitol. But I want to read your, your final paragraph here, because I assume you don't have it in front of you at this moment. But Brian said to the committee, 
Let me conclude with a personal observation. Any realistic appreciation of the situation cannot ignore the current political environment. We the people elect you to represent our interests. Those interests are diverse and often conflicting. Addressing them requires calm discourse, thoughtful deliberation, and creative political compromise. How you conduct yourselves sets the tone, whether it is one of divisive, bellicose rhetoric or instructive civil discourse, the choice is yours. Brian, how was that message received? It, it is difficult to tell because the, 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 that testimony was via Zoom. And so uh, I, I would have a better perception of how the audience reacted uh, other than watching tiny little squares on a, on, on, on a laptop. So I, I, I can't tell you how it was received. Uh, but let me just follow on with, we've been talking about terrorism, we've been talking about counterterrorism legislation, uh, we've been talking about strategies going forward. This is broader than a police problem. This is broader than a law enforcement problem. Our objectives have to transcend how many people we can put in jail for the commission of terrorist crimes. Ultimately, we are gonna to have to deal with the divisions in our own society, which run deep. We want to have as an ultimate, at least as one of our ultimate objectives that we prevent political violence from becoming endemic in American society. And that requires taking that rhetoric down from that kind of bellicosity that we see now. It requires comity, an old fashioned world, word. It requires sense of community. Uh, it requires courage. It requires really something fundamental in our society itself. Those are our ultimate defenses. Ryan, uh, it's a great way to, to close out your comments. I appreciate it so, so much. Javed, um, please take the final minute here, if you will, just you know, briefly your, your closing thoughts. Yeah, so um, uh, even though at times I think my remarks sort of suggest that things are you know, looking grim, and I, I'm, you know, I tend to be a realist about what the threat looks like, um, um, but I still think there's room for optimism. And part of the reason why I'm optimistic about this threat are based on the people who are now in key positions in, of government who are going to have their hands on the steering wheel on policy and strategy uh, to meet this challenge. Um, so as Brian mentioned, uh, Merrick Garland is the uh, got confirmed as the uh, attorney general, the deputy. Uh, Attorney General nominee is a friend of mine, a former colleague, Lisa Monaco. So I think that's a strong team between uh, Lisa and Merrick Garland, folks with counterterrorism and homeland security and national security experience, but also very much rule of law and centrist um, and, just, and decent people. Uh, certainly with my relationship with Lisa, I can, I can speak to that. So I'm heartened by what the DOJ team looks like. All my colleagues at FBI, who I'm still in touch with, they're struggling really hard to, to do the right thing amongst all the different threats they have to cover. So I think the FBI is in a good place. And then in the, the world that I came from um, uh, and the National Security Council, the um, three very critical positions on the NSC for counterterrorism are all filled by former friends and colleagues of mine, and I'm in touch with them. And again, I'm heartened to see the right people in, in key positions who are going to have influence on what this uh, what the government position looks like going forward. So that, I think, is a positive sign. Javed, Javed Ali, Brian, Michael Jenkins, thank you both very much. Uh, we've learned so much from what you've shared with us this evening, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, those of you that have attended tonight. Terrific questions. Did my best to get through as many as we could that had the broadest apl applicability. Thank you so much for sharing your questions as well. And our thanks to judge and community advocates for doing this great series of programs, which continue next Wednesday at uh, five o'clock Pacific time. CNN's Wolf Blitzer. KCRW's Madeline Brandt will talk about the media's role in combating misinformation. It's going to be a terrific event. That's 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 o'clock Eastern.
uh, right here again with Wolf Blitzer of CNN, KCRW Los Angeles's Madeline Brand. I'm Larry Mantle. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a terrific evening.